How does my video look? Welcome, my friends, to another episode of Shoot First, Ask Questions Later. Today, we are joined by Rabbi Jeffrey Sachs, and we are going to be exploring a really fascinating and halakhically complicated case, though Rabbi Sachs will make sure it's not too complicated for us, uh, about shlichus bechalitza, appointing someone to perform a chalitza on the behalf of someone else. Now, we'll talk about chalitza and all the details in just a moment, but first... Rabbi Jeffrey Sachs is the founding director of ATID, the Academy for Torah Initiatives and Directions in Jewish Education in Yerushalayim and its webyeshiva.org program. He is the editor of the journal Tradition, director of research at the Agnon House in Jerusalem, and teaches at Midrash Ramudim. A three-time graduate of Yeshiva University with a bachelor's, master's, and smicha, Rabbi Sachs has published widely on Jewish thought education, and literature, and served as series editor of the S.Y. Agnon Library at the Toby Press. And of course, I have to give uh, personal hot car to that Rabbi Sachs, in his capacity as the director and head editor of Tradition, has served as a mentor for me in my own writing and uh, attempted scholarship. So uh, if there's anything good coming out for me, chances are it's because Rabbi Sachs was behind much of it. Uh, That's certainly with- not true. That's certainly not true. Rabbi Kurtz, you're putting out much wonderful stuff, and I'm I'm very proud to have a small role in helping to bring your writings about Rav Moshe Feinstein to the larger audience of the tradition readership. All right. Well, I really appreciate that. And what we do on the podcast is uh, I appreciate that many guests I have on like to do Rav Moshe Feinstein, and I tell them that's nice. I have another forum that I do that in. So here we try to do some chuvos that maybe our listeners are not as familiar with, and uh, you did not disappoint this is the first time we're going to be looking at a tshuva of the Maharsham. But maybe before you tell us about the Maharsham and you tell us about the unique scenario, maybe just very briefly remind our audience what the nature of Chalitza is, and then we could get into what the complications are that arise in his scenario. Sure. Well, Chalitza, as I'm sure many of our listeners know, is a halakha mitzvah that's outlined at the end of Parshat Ki um, in which if, uh, unfortunately, someone, if a man passes away, leaving no children, then his wife is bound to the dead fellow's brother. And perhaps in the times of uh, Tanakh, they would perform what was called Yibum, in which she would marry the, the brother. Uh, people that are familiar with Megillat Ruth will be forgiven for thinking there are some parallels here. Uh, there are some uh, points of, of of connection. We won't go into all of that. We won't discuss yibum because it is, of course, have been it, it's been abrogated. Uh, yibum is no longer uh, in practice, at least almost almost universally. Uh, but for our purposes, let's say I'm guessing none of our uh, none of our listeners uh, have uh, been aware in our lifetimes of of a case of yibum. But nevertheless, if this brother-in-law and sister-in-law uh, are not going to marry, then this ceremony of chalitza must be performed. Uh, it involves, as as people remember from having read Dvarim Perik Cafe, uh, it involves this uh, event where the woman goes to the Shar Ha'ir, she goes to the Zkenim, what we might call a betin, and she says, this uh, fellow doesn't want to, uh, doesn't want to take me for a wife, and he doesn't want to, he doesn't want to, uh, to upraise the name of his dead brother, the idea being that the children that would be born from this union would somehow be in place of the children the deceased would have brought into the world. And in fact, the whole parasha ends, v'nikrash mo Yisrael beit chalutz hana'al, this fellow who won't help me bring children into the world in place of his dead brother, he's going to undergo this ceremony in which the woman removes his shoe Mm. spits at his feet and says this is what we do to the person that doesn't that doesn't uphold his brother and instead of having a child that's born in the name of the brother this fellow now bears the name of the the spitty shoe removed person if we, if <laughs> he he neglects to perpetuate his brother's legacy exactly now this is thankfully an exceedingly 
rare situation, at least in the modern era, because thankfully people don't catch the cholera or, or tuberculosis or all the other types of things that uh, that uh, would chop a, an otherwise young man down in the prime of his life before he had brought children to the world. Um, although, in fact, it is still the halakha la ma'aseh. Our mutual friend of Yona Reese, the head of the Betin of America, tells me that in all of his many years on the Betin, on average, there's about one a year uh, wow. performed by the Betin of America in, in all of North America and perhaps even beyond that. Now, this whole sugya came back to me with some force because unfortunately here, here in Israel, you know, the nature of things, and it might not be a coincidence that that uh, Chalitza appears in Parshat Ki Tetzela Milchama Aloi Vecha on a parasha, although largely at the beginning of the parasha, but a larger parasha that's dealing with things related to warfare. Mm. Who goes to war? Young men, sometimes young married men who have not yet uh, had the privilege of bringing children into the world. And, you know, everybody here in Israel, I'm sure many of our listeners abroad, know actual cases of young war brides who are childless and have had to perform yibum. And I'm told by a friend in the Rabbanut HaTzfait, the, the military rabbinate, that there have already been, since October 7th, 14 chalitzot performed. Hey. And those are just four, those are just four war widows, meaning widows of chayalim who have been killed. Uh, presumably, there were also civilians uh, at the Nova Festival or or down south, etc. It's an unprecedented, unprecedented, uh, unprecedented uh, number. Absolutely, so it's it's one of those. You know, generally we we would get excited when a certain obscure area of halacha all of a sudden comes back, but this is one of those instances where we we really hope it was just going to be theoretical. Right. Although again, it is a it is a practical halacha, and a woman cannot remarry until chalitza is performed. And if for some reason she's unable to attain chalitza from the brother-in-law, she is for all intents and purposes an aguna. We don't usually use that term in this context, but she is for all intents and purposes an aguna, meaning she's unable to remarry because she is linked to this fellow yeah. until the ceremony is performed. Now, of course, it, it does, even in normal peaceful times, it does happen. Uh, I have an acquaintance uh, who lives near us in Efrat, uh, who sadly was in this situation and she needed chalitza. And when it's performed in the Betin, of course, it's, it's such an unusual thing and people that are interested in halacha want to observe it. And it's, it's a, you know, there are only certain, certain people that are qualified to, um, uh, uh, to oversee the chalitza procedure, just like you have to, to, to be a masader kedushin to perform a wedding or Khalila to be masader aget to arrange a divorce, you need certain knowledge and expertise in those areas of halacha. So too with chalitza, but since it's so rare, there are very few people that know how to do it. Rav, Rav Melech Shechter, the father, Zichrona Lavracha, the father of Rav Herschel Shecht from YU was in America in his day, one of these people that could do this. And there was a, a well-known case in, in Yeshiva University right before I arrived as a student in the 80s in which this couple came and Herschel, Rav, Rav Melech Shechter uh, um, uh, performed this chalitza. It was on the, those of you that know YU, it was on the fifth floor of First Hall and people came to observe it. So this friend of mine, this acquaintance in Efrat, who had to do this a few years ago, she went to the Bet and all these yeshiva students came and you know like they you know you know how yeshiva students are it was to them like the same as going to watch the shal mitzvah that, yeah. but 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 to her she's like why is this whole crowd over so, here watching this so she, very vulnerable moment she tells a story in my in my day job at web yeshiva we have an online course at webyeshiva.org in the daf yomi taught by rabbi gidon rothstein who i think has been a guest on the podcast yes. uh, and when he got up to up to Mesechet Yavamot, whenever that was a little while back, uh, he had her on as a guest on 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 the daily shear, wow. uh, and she spoke about Tachlis. What was the experience of 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 undergoing chalitza, and how at that betin she did a timeout and said, "Listen, fellows, I'm I'm glad for you to see this uh. this unusual mitzvah, but let's pause and remember that we are all here today." because my husband died mm. of illness as a young man without children. So let's put it into some context. It's not like when you're learning shrita and you go to see a, a chicken have its throat cut. Uh, there's a human factor behind this. 
that Our, we should well, well, one could argue we should feel sympathy for the animals as yes, well but we'll right. save that for a separate podcast uh so so, so this the, is an excellent introduction uh in terms of chalitza the halachos the sensitivities that are required when seeing it lamaisa um what was the odd scenario the complicated scenario that the maharsham had to deal with so here's the case before we get to the Maharsham, the case really begins before it gets fed up the halachic ladder to the Maharsham, who was the Posei Kador at that moment, at the end of the 19th, very beginning of the, of the 20th century. There was a Rav in Odessa who turned to the Sokachov, to Rav Avram Borstein, who was one of the great rabbinic and and rabbinic figures in Europe at the time. Sokhtchev, he was the author, of, of course, of the Avni Nezer and the Egle Tal. He died in 1910. It's not precisely clear uh, when this case takes place, but it has to be the very, very last years of the 19th or 1900, the very last years of the 19th century or 1900, 1901 maximum, because the Tshuva is already published in 1900, 1902. In Odessa, there's a young woman whose husband dies. Now, it happens that we get some background information. It was a really bad marriage. Mm. And they didn't always live together. It seems from the very beginning, the marriage was was rocky and they didn't live together. And he would like bring her back and then he would she would leave. That's not completely germane, but it does become tangentially germane uh, later to the story. But in, indeed, indeed, they were they were they were married. But then he dies. And she's in need of chalitza. The only problem is that his only brother, the only person that can perform the chalitza, had immigrated to America. And not just to America, to Portland, Oregon, wow. as far away as you can get from, from Odessa. And on top of that, he's not religious anymore, um, which is also tangentially relevant to this, leaving her an aguna. This is 1899 or so, right? The chances of her getting from Odessa, this, how old is she? She's 19, 20, 21 years old, mm -hmm. right? The chances of her getting from Odessa to Portland, Oregon are about the same as her getting to the dark side of the moon. <laughs> and he, being irreligious, is not really interested in getting back to getting back to Odessa to help out this sister-in-law because of this, what no doubt to him seems like a bizarre ritual. So this Shaila is addressed to the Sokachover and the Sokachover turns to the Maharsham, who was, they were more or less contemporaries. Maharsham was three years or so older, but Maharsham was recognized as, as the Godel Hador. The Maharsham is of Shalom Mordechai Cohen Shvadrun. He's born in 1835. He dies in 1911. He's this great Galiziana figure from uh, from uh, from uh, you know what today what today is southern Poland, mm. uh, but then was Galicia at this period of time. Galicia is part of the Austro-Hungarian Empire. This is not the Pale of Settlement in in Russia, and it's not more northern latitudes in in what we call what we call uh, Poland. He was the Godelador in Galicia, and after the death of Rav Yitzchak Specter in 1896, he's recognized not just as the Godelador, but the Posekador. So this Shaila comes to him at this in this window when he is the undisputed, the undisputed halachic, halachic figure. So if questions of Aguna come up, have to go to the Godel Hador. Kal Vachomer, a complicated thing. Because one of the curious things, we all know there's a big fat Masechet Yevamos, mm. and Chalitza is discussed in at length in Yevamos, but interestingly, this question of Shlichut B'Chalitza. It's fascinating, because in Gittin, we, we talk we talk in, ad nauseum about the notion Gittin, of a get with a Shlichut. In Gittin, in Kedushin, in Dinei Mamanot, all across Shas, we're talking about Shlichut. But it is not explicit in Shas whether or not Chalitza could or could not be done with with. Uh, with a shaliach, with an agent, I, I'm the, I'm the, the, the widowed bride in Odessa. I can't make it to Portland, but I hear that somebody else from Odessa is going to Portland. I will appoint him as my shaliach, 
and he will go and in my stead, just like a man can appoint a shaliach to be makadesh a woman, right? Not a very romantic wedding, but <laughs> he's not even present. And a man, certainly everybody who's learned the first the first, uh, the first beginning of of uh, of, of Masechet Gittin, uh, everybody knows you can send a bill of divorce to your wife by shaliach, by agent, by by messenger. Maybe because precisely because chalitza is so rare, even in antiquity, it was probably quite rare. Um, maybe because of that, they didn't get around to discussing every every particular case. And what's fascinating about this is not just the halachic groundbreaking that's taking place here, but is also just, well, talking about the ground or geographic locations that we just shifted to the American, the, I guess what you would call the early pre-war American landscape. Were there any rabbinic, you know, post skim or rabbinic agents who were operating on the American side of the pond? Well, there, there, there were, but it didn't really matter because this fellow was outside of the realm of rabbinic influence. Mm -hmm. The rabbi in Odessa is writing to him on behalf of the widow saying, listen, fella, you got to do something. You have to come back. You have to make this. You have to save her. She's stuck. Uh, so there's no local authority, certainly not in Portland, who who can really who can really uh, take this on. But I do think I think you, Moshe, you're putting your finger exactly right on it. Why does this question come up now in antiquity? People rarely traveled, moved away from home very great distances. On average, people lived within about 50 miles of where they were born. Right? So the furthest that a brother-in-law could have gotten was generally not that far. And a minuscule number of brothers-in-law are ever called upon to have to do to have to do chalitza. No doubt, even in antiquity, there were such cases, but when it's only a very, very, very rare case, you don't set precedence. So how do they how do they wind up establishing contact so with this guy and navigating it? That we don't know. We we don't know. Uh, presumably, the family had his address. The family knew how to get in touch with him. We don't know. We don't know their names. And and sadly, jumping ahead, spoiler alert: we don't know how it ultimately got resolved in this particular in this particular case. What what was the fate of 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 these people? But, but what, what's happening in the 19th century? In 1840, there's 15,000 Jews in, in America, right? A, a, a tiny number, right? There are more Jews than that that live, you know, within a two block radius on the west side of Manhattan today <laughs> than, the whole, than the whole United States. By 1880, just 40 years later, there's a quarter of a million Jews in the United States. Mostly that huge wave of immigration was mostly German Jews. But in the 35 years after that, between 1880 and 1914, the beginning of World War I, there's an additional 2 million Jews that arrive. And that wave of immigration, that giant wave of immigration, almost everyone listening to us is descended from somebody that was part of that part of that immigration. Those two million Jews are are largely Eastern European Jews. Those are Galiziana Jews, Polish Yitin, Jews from the Pale of Pale of Settlement, uh, the area that was the Pale of Settlement in in uh, in 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 Russia, and this gives rise to a different a different reality. There's a wonderful book that I heartily recommend by somebody who's become recently become a, a friend named Akiva Sternberg. It's a book in, in Hebrew, large, 680 pages, Eretz Lo Nodat. Hmm. In the English title is Terra Incognita, or the, I would call, I would have called it the undiscovered country. America, the challenges of halachic figures of poskim with immigration to the United States covering the period of 1850 to 1924. So this is our period. And this the last chapter, long chapter in the book, deals with this case of Agunot and, and Chalitza and, and other things. So for one very good reference, I, I heartily recommend this book by, by Akiva Sternberg in Hebrew. In tradition, we ran a review of it a little while a little while back. So this question of Shlichut Bachalitza suddenly becomes... A, a practical question. How are we going to get these two people together from different sides of the of the world?
Absolutely. So let's get to maybe the the Psaac of the Maharsham and just briefly maybe some of the reception because I imagine there was some pushback on this. And then what I'd really love to make sure we budget some time in for is that I know you dealt with a case in real life yeah. that <laughs> mirrors I, the Maharsham. I so I really want to make sure we get to that. I think our listeners okay. will really want to hear so that. Very, so very briefly, we're talking about <clears throat> we're talking about the, the Shut Maharsham. Maharsham wrote I think something like 1300 Shuvot and how they got organized in his published Shutim, multi-volume Shutim, I'm not certain, but this is one of the very first in the very first volume. This is the Shut Marsham, Chelek Aleph, Simen Yud Dalid. It's available on Hebrew books. It's available on the Barilan. You can read it yourself. He is aware that there's a Gemara in Yevamot, Daf Kuf Vav Omed Aleph, 106a, and in Ketubot, Daf Ayin Dalid Omed Aleph, 74a, that do seem to indicate there's no such thing as Shlichut in, in, in Chalitza. Rashi there says, Chalitza Iev Shalakaima Al Yedei, Al Yedei Shaliach. And the Rashba in his Chuvot similarly is, is stringent about this as well. But the Maharsham says, not necessarily. And when we say you can't make a shaliach, who can't make a shaliach? It's clear from those earlier sources in the Rishonim that the brother-in-law cannot make a shaliach. Hmm. But is it clear that the sister-in-law, the Yavma, that she can't make a shaliach to go and untie the shoe and spit on the on the foot of the of of the fellow. He writes to the Sakachover who had passed this question along to him. The chuva opens about this poor Aguna woman from Odessa, who was married and the husband died and left left behind no children, and the brother-in-law went off to Medina Tayam. Rachok kama alafim parsaot, many thousands of this Talmudic measure, mm. right? We know it's about 6,000 miles as the crow flies. The Medinat Portland, Shemever America. Portland <laughs> on the other side of, of, of America. And this fellow is a Russia. And when the rabbi from Odessa sent him a letter, he got a reply full of all types of insults and curses. This is somebody who has no respect for. For the Torah, and the suggestion is that the woman should send a shaliach to go, and that shaliach will recite the psukim and will untie the shoelace and will will spit. I say shoelace; it's not a shoelace. Anybody that's seen, you can. The truth is, you can go onto YouTube and you can you can see videos of of chalitzot. It's this rather. Uh, and strange looking leather sandal with straps that kind of look like uh, tefillin straps. Oh, yeah. That's what we're, that's what we're talking about. So the Maharsham responds and he tries to use an idea that had been floated before him. About 25 years earlier, there was a Dayan in Warsaw named of Shlomo Hillel Frieder. I don't know much about him. I don't think there is much known about him. And he published only one Sefer. As a matter of fact, he didn't publish it. Three years after he died in 1874, his son published a, a slim volume with his Chidushim on the Rambam and on certain Mesechdot in Shas. Because he was a Dayan, I guess he had to deal with matters related to divorce. And the section on Hilchot Gerushin in the Rambam is significant. And this book, this book called Yad Shlomo, by Rav Frieder can also be found on on Hebrew books, and you can read what he what he says there. But he advances this idea that it's true the brother-in-law cannot make a shaliach because it's a mitzvah haguf. Mm. He has to put the shoe on his foot, and right. just like, like I can't appoint someone to wear tefillin on my behalf. Exactly, that's precisely what Frieder says. Just like I can't make you my my agent to put tefillin on your arm on my behalf, so. So the the brother-in-law can't do the same thing here. He has to. It's a it's a it's a mitzvah aguf, and not every not every mitzvah can be assigned to a to a to a to a shaliach. But he suggested. Now again, it could be that he was talking about an actual case that came before him. 
I, I believe that was, I think, believe he was thinking about, but it's not clear that this was an actual halacha that he paskent. Remember, this is not a set of shelo to chuvot. It's a more theoretical work of lumdis, even though I do think in the context, he is talking about an actual case, but he says, so what about the woman? Mm -hmm. So the woman, she has a tafkid mitzum tzam. Right? She has a much more limited role in this whole thing. And this the spitting, the rikika, uh, is not, in all cases, in all cases, the spitting, we would be surprised to learn, and you only learn this if you learn Hilchot uh, Chalitza, the actual spitting, which seems like, I don't know, the highlight of the whole event, is <laughs> not ma'akev. Wow. It has to just be that she's able she could have spit uh, it's a royal she, abila kind of idea and exactly royal abila she was able to 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 hack up a good a good spit but uh, but that she needn't actually show up physically and she just needed to have been able to be in the betin but if she sends a shaliach, he suggests theoretically it could be that this would be okay and this is exactly what the marasham says he says inyan hakriya the, the, the reciting of the posuk that she has to say that this is the guy that won't uphold his brother's household and the spitting, as long as she's able to do it. So, and if she's able to be in the betin when it happens, so how could she be able to be? In the, she's in Odessa. The ceremony would take place 6,000 miles away in Portland. How could she be there? So he says, Bizman has a, he's living in the modern era. And mm. the Marsham, you know, we always think that we're modern and that whatever was going on 120 years ago was ancient times. But wherever you are, whenever you are, that's modernity. And the end of the 19th, beginning of the 20th century, Marsham is precisely wrestling with lots of questions of new technology. He says, Bizman hazeh, efshar al yedei kadur haporeach be'avir in parentheses, he says, a luft balloon. Whoa. Whoa. So she could, <laughs> theoretically, she could take a hot air balloon from <laughs> Odessa to Portland, meaning it's possible to get there. Wow. It's interesting. He doesn't say since she possibly could get on a steamship, right? Which is yeah. a much plausible way for people to travel from Odessa to the, Portland. This sticks in your head better. Train. But he says could, she could get there through, a, she could take a hot air balloon. Uh, so since she could be there, then we would allow her to wow. to to take a thing. So now the truth is, Refrider was the first to suggest this, maybe as a practical halacha, but it had already been discussed a quarter of a century before him, meaning a half century before the case that we're discussing with the Marsham by Rav Yaakov Etlinger, the Aruch Laner. Uh, in a comment, there it really is within the realm of of Lumdis, In a comment on that Gemara in Yevamot Daf. Of, of Omid Aleph. Well, well, I think I think what a lot of this demonstrates is just how desperate the situation is that we have to start taking these obscure svarim and even svarim that are not necessarily written for halachah misa purposes, for practical purposes, and just you know doing all the research, taking books right. off the shelf, trying to find some precedent right. or right. basis uh, to be makel in a shasar chak ve'igun gadol, where right. there's an so aguna. So I think that's that's precisely the point, and it shows. By the way, this is an interesting sidebar to all of your conversations with all of your guests and your 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 inquisitive uh, exploration of, of different chuvot is the intersection between theory and practice, between lamdus and psak, and how one can feed into the other. So exactly, and that's precisely what, what the Marasham says this is in a case of b'shas hadchak, this is an emergency, and igu. And if we don't find a way to do this, there is just simply no, this 20-year-old this girl is going to be aguna mm -hmm. for the rest of her life. So he is inclined to be lenient and to allow a to allow a uh, a shaliach, and he's mitzaref two other lenient factors to kind of tip the scale. One is the fact that it's at least a question: what was the state of this marriage? 
Mm Because as I said, it was a bad marriage. And from the beginning, they weren't really living together, although it seems clear the marriage had been consummated. But he says, since at least it's a question about the the Kiddushin, I mean, in all cases, everybody would agree that if the husband left her and didn't give her a get, she'd be an aguna. We wouldn't Mm -hmm. say that there was no Kiddushin. But he says, it's a question. And the other case being that since the brother-in-law is non-religious. Now, the Gemara says that if the brother-in-law is a mumar, uh, 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 a heretic who's left the faith, so then she wouldn't even need chalitza from at all. But the overwhelming consensus, even amongst brothers-in-law in Europe in the 19th century, after the rise of secularism and the rise of a phenomenon in which you can have Jews who've left observance, but who haven't necessarily converted, the rise of the existence of something called a secular Jew. Mm. So the overwhelming consensus of the postkin was that as long as the fellow hadn't actually converted it doesn't matter how irreligious is. He's not a mumar for this purpose. Right. Not Hashem says maybe he's like a little bit of a mumar. So mm-hmm. with these two other reasons. These are all um, mitigating factors to sniff him. Right. So he says, he he concludes by saying, So he says, I will rely on this feeder, the Yad Shlomo, of a rak ba'ofen, but rak ba'ofen im yaskimu od rabanim muvhakim b'toro v'yira but only if other holy rollers, holy righteous, learned rabbis and poskim are prepared to sign on to this. So it's a good, it's a good case, hedging of the bets, you know. Right, it's a really de this this is, Right, this is a case of igun and hatsalat nefesh. It's life or death for this for this young woman. Mm-hmm. And just because of the other mitigating factors I mentioned above, because the truth is, the, the Rashba, he doesn't mention Rashi, he says, you know, I'm going up against heavy hitters here. And in order to be lenient, I can't do this alone. And what happened? Even the Sokachover, who was the one that sent him the question, mm. doesn't agree with the answer. Wow. And the Sokachover in the Avne Nezer writes his own version of the truth. Basically, he writes the case and then he, he writes the opinion of the Marsham that he with whom he had consulted. And then he explains why he is not comfortable relying on, on that. And there were others that that there were others that uh, that that disagreed with the, the Marsham, and really almost nobody was prepared. There were different periods in a later generation where there was another attempt to resurrect the leniency, and that was put down by the by the Gedolim of of their time. And it seems that you know the Sukkot says, "What did you say? Say a man can't appoint a shaliach because it's a mitzvah and a goof like wearing tefillin." Right. The woman too. On the contrary. The woman's role is much more active. She's much what more the, active. What do the psukim say? Listen to all the verbs of action that she has to take. Ve'alta ivamto hasha'ara el haskenim. Ve'amra, she says, me'ein yivmi lahakim la'achim shem b'Yisrael. She makes this declaration, this verbal declaration, even though verbal declarations are somewhat easier to appoint a, a shaliach. Ve'nigsha yivamto a love. She approaches him. She confronts him. In the sight, this is performed in the sight of the of the zkenim, of the dayanim. And she unstraps his shoe. She spits and she recites and she says, So and, and then this sounds like the antithesis of a get to, of a get or kiddushin, where she's playing the active role. Yes, so if he yes. can't appoint a shliach, you would think certainly she can't appoint a shliach. But if I if I may, Rabbi Sachs, um, I see we have about two minutes left, oh, and okay. I really want you to just maybe briefly you could choose. You want to tell us either about your personal interaction so, uh, with this. How case. did I become interested in this sugya? A number of years ago, I was asked to be masada kiddushin at a wedding of people from my community in Efrat. This is not something that I do terribly frequently, but I was happy to do it in this case because it was uh, someone who was some someone who was a, a, a divorced man who was marrying a widowed a widowed woman. She was widowed. 
and her husband, she and her husband did not have children, but her first marriage was his second marriage. And he had a son from the from his first marriage. So there's no need for 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 Khalidza because he had children, a child. It turns out that this woman, it's a, it's a kind of crazy story you only hear about in, uh, it's a kind of story like the Gemara makes up to demonstrate a case and you can't imagine it actually happens. She was in fact a Gioret, she was a convert. When she married this fellow, she had a conversion of convenience with some reform or conservative betin in order to make his parents uh, satisfied. But nobody in the family was religious. And, you know, aside from having uh, checking the box that some form of conversion was completed, that's all that anybody was interested in. But as sometimes happens in this crazy world of ours, even through that conversion, she became very interested in our faith and our heritage. And she was Jose Bechuva, and he followed in her footsteps. She had a conversion, Al Pialocha, a proper halachic conversion. They had another marriage, Kedat Moshev Yisrael. And, you know, she was so set on being a good Jew, she knew that the one of the mitzvot she had to do was to make Aliyah. And she <laughs> says, we have to go live in Eretz Yisrael. Follow the Ramban. So and it was a sincere, it was a sincere conversion, a sincere, a sincere tshuva. And she, to this day, is a, is an observant woman. Unfortunately, shortly after they came in Aliyah, this fellow got sick and and passed away. And then she met this other person from my community, and they, and they got married. So I had a question: What do you write in the ketubah? In the ketubah, you write something, a title that's assigned to the status of the woman, betulta for a, for a virgin a bride, uh, itita for a, 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 in the case of in the case of a, of a gioret, you indicate she's a gioret. This somehow indicates who she is and isn't allowed to be married to to koanim to others, a divorcee. What what say you? So I wasn't sure exactly what to write in the ketuba. Do you indicate that she's is her title that she's a gioret mm. or that she's an almona, that she's a, that she's a, wow. a, a widow. But then in the course of conversation, it came out and it shows you that a rabbi has to ask even the most obvious questions, which I had, I'm, I fully admit I had overlooked. It turned out that the fellow's first wife was not Jewish and had not even had any form of conversion, which was a source of aggravation to his parents, which is why when he remarried, he requested that she have a pro forma oh non-halachic conversion just to satisfy his parents to get them off his back. My, my head is spinning. I need one of those Yavamos charts if from I, the Gemara. Yes, if, I, if I had a blackboard, this would be easier. <laughs> so it turned out, it turned out, it turns out that the son from his first marriage is not Jewish, not halachically, not in any manner. His mother was in no way Jewish. And the non-Jewish child of a, a dead man does not solve the problem of chalitza. Uh -huh. For the pr purposes of chalitza, even though he had had a biological son, he didn't have a Jewish son, and his widow now needs chalitza. This is discovered a couple of weeks before the wedding. Yikes. Where's the brother-in-law? Well, he's not in Portland, but he was someplace out on that side of the world. Brother-in-law is completely non-observant, has never heard of any of this, doesn't know that spitting is involved. And he's not really interested in coming to Israel to perform some ancient ritual. For some reason, it was difficult for her to get away a couple of weeks before her, before her wedding to get there. So I started looking to this whole question only to discover it's no simple matter. Fortunately, it was all worked out. She did go. There was a bet in in a certain place. I don't want to give away too many identifying details, but good friends and and uh, passionate, dedicated uh, rabbis were very helpful in making this all work out. And on time, the couple stood under the chuppah and I performed their wedding. So that's how I became interested in this whole topic of 
shlichut bechalitza because I was involved, as unlikely as it is in 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 my little rabbinic career, I was involved in what may have been, you know, one of the only cases in in halachic history of a of a of a gioret almana chalutza shlichut and bringing together all of these all of these. So that's like a a really. I don't want to say wacky because that could sound a little bit uh, that could lack reverence for the gravity of the matter, but it's a little bit of a wacky case, a really crazy and complicated case drawing upon multiple areas of halacha that the average Masada Kedushin, like I would never think to ask. And it's, so anyway, how did you resolve this in the end? And did the Maharsham's tshuva play a factor in the calculation? Well, I mean, again, again, I don't want to uh, overstate my... Uh my expertise in this. And to be clear, I was not involved in past getting any of these shilas. I was just a conduit to others that were involved, both people here in Israel and the Bet in abroad that actually took care of the of the of the Chalitza. But of course, you know, it is the consensus in Bate Din today that uh, Shlichut is not done, that the Maharsham's suggested leniency, which even he himself walks back in the absence of other support. And we should mention there were other, for to abbreviate the story, there there were there were other halachic arguments against it, which were marshaled against the Marsham, and people can find the Marmakomos and and learn them up on their own. Um but uh, but that's not the case. As a matter of fact, I had mentioned earlier Yona Reese, who of course is responsible for these things in the United States for the Betin of America. And as I said, he told me it's you know at most one case of Khalid Sayyir. And he told me in the 25 years he's been involved in this, he can really only think of one case where wow. uh, had Shlichut been available, it would have greatly alleviated the complication. But even in that case, it somehow worked out because frankly, we don't need to take hot air balloons. A hot balloons air balloon, right. <laughs> as inconvenient travel, as it might be today, it's more and, viable. Right? And, if, and if necessary, the Dionim can get onto a plane and uh, and 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 meet people elsewhere. So we live in a world where these things are more easily are more easily uh, facilitated. Right. And this brings me to, I think was the last thing that I wanted you to share with our listeners. I know that you are an eminent scholar in the literature of Shai Agnon. And you, of course, there is some Shai Agnon tie-in for you. Yes. So, so uh, you know, Agnon, of course, is the great Hebrew, the greatest Hebrew uh, writer, the only Hebrew writer to win a Nobel Prize. And part of his accomplishment as a writer and what makes him so interesting, you know, to me and why I think our readers should be interested in him if they can read him in Hebrew. If not, there's a very fine series of books in, in English, which I had a hand in, um, is his intertextual delving into the Torah bookshelf and trying to create modern literature that grows out of the rabbinic literature, principally the rabbinic literature. Uh, Agnon's greatest novel is called Tmol Shilshom. In, Engl in English, it's in, actually in a rather problematic translation, not from my series, uh, called Only Yesterday, published by Princeton University Press. Um, it's the story of the second Aliyah, that great wave of immigration to the land of Israel in, in that decade, right? In, in that decade before, before World War I, more or less around the time that this story is taking place in, in Odessa. And it's a story of a young, of a young Ole named Yitzchak Kumer, who comes from Galicia, comes from Buchach, uh, Agnon's own hometown. And he comes on Aliyah. And I'm going to make a very long story, very short. In the end, he marries, he marries a, a, a young woman named Shiva, a girl named Shifra. She's like all of 19 years old. Girl named Shifra from Mea Sharim from Bate Hungarin. Uh, she comes from a real Kanoi Hungarian family. <laughs> and tragically, Yitzchak is bit by a rabid dog, who's one of the great characters in all of Hebrew literature. This dog, this sentient dog, who takes up many hundreds of pages of the of the novel with his own plot. The dog's name is Balak, believe it or not, for reasons which I'll leave it to you to discover. And he he dies. He he's bitten during the week of Sheva Brachot, right. and then he dies from rabies. And she's left an aguna because they have no children. And all throughout the novel, he's thinking of his little brother Yudel, 
who's left behind in Buchach. And he knows he'll never see Yudel again because he's never going to go back to Buchach. He's never going to go back to Galicia. And little Yudel is never going, going to come on Aliyah. It was so unusual for people to come on Aliyah in the first place back then. So all throughout novel, uh, Agnon's left these little breadcrumbs that the brother of the main character is never going to make it to Yerushalayim. Now, it's never said explicitly because the novel ends. And to the best of my knowledge, in all of the literary criticism on this great Hebrew novel, nobody's pointed out that Shifra is basically an aguna. She cannot remarry because she needs chalitza from a brother who's not in Portland, Oregon, but he might be just as far away because there's no practical way for this poor girl from Yerushalayim and this poor boy from, who I mean impoverished, uh, uh, from 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 Galicia to 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 physically meet minus minus uh, shlichut. Interestingly, Agnon wrote a postscript to the novel and decided to be Gonez. He put it aside. It was discovered in his archives many years later after he died. In the in the rejected ending. We get a kind of like, you know, one of these scenes at the end of the movie 20 years later. <laughs> it turned out that during the week of Sheva Brachot, Shifra had become pregnant uh, and gives birth to a child. She's a widow, but she gives birth to, to, to nine, so you no, know, no nine, nine, month, nine months, nine months minus a week. The child of Yitzchak is born. So she doesn't need Chalitza. Huh. But Agnon rejects that ending that he had drafted, and it ends as a tragedy, just as our story ends as a tragedy. We don't we don't know the name of this poor woman from Odessa, we don't know the name of her wicked brother in law in Portland, but we know that the Rabbonim were unable to find a way to create a heter for her to send a shaliach. We don't know. Maybe in the end she got on a boat and went to Portland. Maybe they met in New York. I'd like to think we can invent a happy end for this, but maybe there wasn't one. It's a, it's an example of a tragic end, of a halachic tragedy, because uh, if we're committed to the halacha, sometimes we have to bow our heads and say there's there's just no way out. It's a, it's a very sad story. And Agnon also writes a sad story. Now he does, it's only hidden between the lines. Only somebody that's holding in the sugya is even going to be attentive to it. But it struck me in Agnon's library at the Beit Agnon in Yerushalayim, where we have a study center and a museum to his life. We have this rich library of about 10,000 volumes. It's the entire uh, Torah library, the, 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 the Svarim of a learned Jew. And Agnon was a learned and observant Jew. And he particularly specialized in the books of the Galician Rabbonim. Whoa. And right there, right above his, his writing stand, his gender, is the big fat Shut Maharsham. No way. 1902 edition. That's not surprising. What is surprising is that when you open it up to Simon Yudalid, there are two little markings in the margin, two what look to me exclamation points. Now, this was not, Agnon was not the original owner of this book. Many of his books were bought secondhand. I cannot say definitively that this is Agnon's handwriting. And the truth is, Agnon didn't usually write in his books. He often left scraps of paper, little, little bookmarks. But it seems to me that he was aware of the issue of Shlichut Bechalitza. And that's built in between the lines of this great work of modern Hebrew literature, which springs forth from the sources of, of halacha. He certainly would have been aware of the Maharsham's uh, writing and his chuvas, and this is a chuva right there towards the beginning of the book, and maybe even he left behind as a breadcrumb for, for me all these many years later to come and discover that that's the hint, that's the smoking gun. Oh my gosh, my, my mind he, is just blown by that. To the Maharsham when he when he when he uh, was was crafting this great novel of the second Aliyah. 
That's that's just remarkable. My my mind is blown by that. There's uh, I, I could see over there. You know, you ever see in those um, in the at least in the movies, I don't know in real life where they have the FBI investigation. You have the red string from that piece <laughs> yes. to that piece of evidence. That's what this feels like over no, here, and it all comes together. Rabbi Kurtz, I'll I'll do you one better and tell you that this is the premiere of this piece of information. I haven't shared this publicly with oh. anyone else yet, but I've been thinking of writing it up. But your invitation to be a guest on the fabulous Shoot First, Ask Questions Later podcast. It just struck me this is the time to let the world in on this on this discovery. And it's also the time, of course, to remember how many chalitzot mm. we've had here in, in Yerushalayim just, just this year alone. And, uh, you know, the idea that this this is rare and tragic because anytime this mitzvah is performed, it's it's done in response to a real human tragedy. And in these cases, these whatever it is, 14 or 15 cases so far since October 7th, everyone is an entire world of, of tragedy. And we have to remember that as well. Absolutely. And I, I want to thank you for sharing that novel information with us. I really hope that you you do write that up. And uh, I'll do my best on my end with the podcast mm -hmm. to get this out more broadly. And, um, and the second part about what you said, of course, we, we hope and pray that unlike most areas of halacha, that chalitza should become lidro shula kabel schar. It should only be relegated back to the realm of the theoretical, and it should, God willing, no longer be necessary going forward. Hopefully, we should uh, hear besoros tovos in the days ahead. Thank you so much, Rabbi Sachs. Thank you, Rabbi Kurtz.